Jesus preaching on John the Baptist. Oh, here we go. I'm I'm man enough to wear it, so. <laughs> Amen. That's nice. I'm gonna give that to my wife. So. Anyways, uh, this morning I was preaching on John the Baptist, and uh, in the story of John the Baptist, it talks about there was a man sent from God, John the Baptist, and I believe that Brother Denny Mitchell is one of those men. Uh, we didn't go looking for Brother Denny Mitchell. I had no idea who he was or where he came from. Uh, he just stopped in the church uh, oh, year and a half, maybe three years ago or so when we were in the other building. And uh, we, I got to speak with him and meet with him. And I just knew that God had his hand on him, that he had a heart for souls. He wasn't just someone who talked about soul winning. He actually went out and, soul, and went soul winning and won souls. And uh, I just have so much respect. I follow him on Facebook. and consistently they're seeing souls saved. And homeless people, they're not necessarily the easiest people to witness to or people who are struggling. A lot of them struggle with mental illness. And he's not out there getting any cheap salvations either. He talks to people. He meets them where they're at. He gives them the gospel. And I am so thankful for the Mitchell family. Of course, we heard her sing Wednesday night. I was talking to my wife, and uh, she's like, God, Miss Mitchell sing. We could have them come do a revival sometime. And I'm like, I think we need to do that. I think we're going to have them come in different seasons, though. So I can take him fishing one season and hunting another season. And eventually we'll get back to soul winning, but uh, amen. But I love the Mitchell family. I've been so impressed with the whole family. Faith, uh, just wonderfully behaved. I hope my daughters take after her. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, she's uh, such a sweet young girl. And, uh, of course, Mrs. Mitchell's wonderful and then Brother Mitchell. And I'm excited to have him come preach for us one more time. So come preach at us, Brother Mitchell. I just want to say it's good to be in the Lord's house, and uh, I just want to thank Ben. I want to thank you guys, thank the church for everything y'all have done for us, for all your prayer support, your financial support, for everything you've done. And uh, this week has been a blessing to us. I know one time uh, I, the pastor, he was afraid that we were together too much, that we wouldn't want to come back. But I tell you, we've really loved the fellowship this week. Uh, all those that invite us to their homes and they fed us, and uh, we don't get that treatment everywhere we go. So I really enjoyed it. Uh, even the, the pastor even cooked us lobster. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, he said, you like lobster? And I said, well, I'm not against it. I just, you know, the only two times in my life I ever eat lobster was back in the 90s. And uh, that was at a Japanese restaurant. And uh, so that's not a lobster I've ever eaten, but he even taught me how to suck the juice out of the cloth. <laughs> so we had a we had a good time. It's uh, had a great time here in Maine. And uh, we love you guys. And like, uh, like I say, this is just like our home away from home. I mean, the church anyway. We love this church, and uh, we love you guys, and we love a still working church. You don't see that everywhere you go. So we're praying for you guys, praying that God will do great things here. And uh, like I said, the ministry, I was praying that we'd see more people today. But we had who God wanted here. And I look back at our ministry now that we got a day center there in Bristol. And when we started that ministry, the first couple of days we did it, we had four or five people. And within a couple of months, we had about 50 to 60 people. So I'm telling you, that's how God works God's able. And uh, but we're praying for you guys. And, um, you know, like I say, I appreciate you all. I appreciate the warm welcome. After I preached tonight, you might tell me not to come back, though. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I went back to the room. And when I left here today, I had a message on my heart that I was going to preach. And I'm just trying to follow God. I went back to the room, and I, as I sit there, I went to another message. And then I went to another. After about four messages, the Lord sent me to a place uh, over to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And uh, so we're going to start there in Mark chapter 5 tonight. And I'm going to read several verses, so you guys just bear with me. But uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Our dear, gracious, heavenly Father has come to you tonight. Lord, just want to thank you once again for this great honor and privilege to be here in your house tonight. Lord, thank you for this week, Lord, for our friends here, Lord, our time of fellowship, Lord. But most of all, thank you for the souls that were saved this week, Lord. I'm so thankful, Lord, that there's still souls being saved. So thankful, Lord, for that blood today. Lord, it's still saving old sinners. And Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that you'd be with us in this service. I pray that this church would continue to grow for your glory. 
that the outreaches would continue, Lord, that they would continue the, the flame, Lord, would continue to burn, Lord, that uh, they'd be on fire here, Lord, for you tonight, Lord, for your glory tonight, Lord. It's not about me tonight, Lord. It's not about the pastor. It's not about any man here, but it's all about Jesus. And, Lord, we just pray today, Lord, you continue to bless this church, Lord. I pray you continue to bless our ministry, Lord, and just use us in a mighty way for your glory and all we do. And we just ask you all these things in the sweet, precious name of Jesus. Amen. But I'm going to read several verses here, so y'all bear with me. But uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 1 said, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains plucked, had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him, them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave the leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were all about 2,000 and, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what was done or what was that was done. And they come to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil and had a legion set in and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great of things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great of things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. And you know, I got to, I got to studying this and I got to praying and uh, seeking the Lord's will and got to thinking about this man and his story. We know that this man, we know that he was wicked. We know that he was evil. He'd been possessed. And uh, we know that there was over 2,000 demons in this man because there was 2,000 of those swine. But this man, they took him over there and they put him in the tombs and they left him over there to get rid of him. They tried to chain this man. They tried to bound this man. They couldn't do anything with him. And he would run around and he was over there and he was cutting himself. The man, he was miserable. But the thing about this man, Today we would label him as being mentally ill. We'd say that man's mentally ill, but this man was demonically possessed. And I'm going to tell you, demonic possession is real today. In the day that we're living in, there's a lot of demonic possession. But then I got to thinking a little bit more about this man in the story. And I got to thinking how this man, his Bible don't say. But I got to thinking, this man was probably at one time he was somebody's little boy. He was somebody's child. He probably lived a normal life. You ever thought about this? This man, he may have lived a normal life, may have come up, may have had a normal childhood, just like the other kids. But somewhere in his life, something happened to this man to put him in the position that he was in. And I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking about how the devil works on us. And I got to thinking about how the devil, he don't just come in all one big time. It's a little bit at a time. 
a little bit at a time. And I got to thinking about some of the demons that we play in this world. Some of the things that we go through in this world are the demons that's in our lives that can put us in this same condition. You realize today we can be in that same condition. This man, this man here, he was possessed. I believe he was lost. And I realize today we can't lose our salvation. But I'm going to tell you, if we can be absolutely miserable and we can get down, we can hit rock bottom. So how is that some of these demons of the world? Some of these demons that we let creep into our lives. And I got to thinking about what are some of the things today that we let in our lives. And this first one, very controversial. Y'all may kick me out of Maine. But I got to thinking about that demon of alcohol. The demon of alcohol. You say, what are you talking about? And I know people today, everywhere you go, everybody wants to drink. Today it's became part of our society. It's became acceptable everywhere you go. But the Word of God tells us in Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And you know, I ain't going, I've preached on alcohol before. There's a lot of scripture in the Bible about alcohol. And I've heard people say, well, Jesus drank wine. I'm going to tell you, you need to get in the Word of God. You need to study because I'm going to tell you today that if we go back and we study the word wine, back in that day, it was two definitions. There was fermented wine. Well, then there was juice. That word wine, most of the time, was nothing more than juice. Let me tell you, Christ didn't go around carrying a Bud Dumber or a Miller Low Life. He didn't go around carrying that. But today, we think that's got to be acceptable everywhere we go. I think about back home. enjoy the fireworks and but you know what they had to move it. Downtown, you know why so they can have their beer. They gotta have their beer. Everything today has to revolve around alcohol. Our grocery store, our newest grocery store. They got a bar right in the middle of the store. You go to the store, they put these uh, cup holders on the buggy. So when you go in our shop you can get your beer or whatever got to have that while you shop. Right there on the buggy. Just put it on your buggy and walk over to the store drinking. That's the way it is. But we've accepted this today. And let me tell you, that alcohol is the worst demon that we're facing in America. You say, why do you say that? It's destroyed more homes. It's broke up more marriages. It's killed more people on their highway. It ain't nothing anything else that we're facing. But yet we make excuses. So ain't nothing wrong with one drink. Let me tell you, every alcoholic started one drink. Everybody started one little drink. I'll never forget, I had a lady. Her name's Tammy. Tammy, she lived on the streets there in Abingdon for about 13, 14 years. We ministered to her. And, uh, of course, I didn't know her all those years, but she was homeless 13, 14 years, living on the streets. We'd take her to church, and we'd take her to outreaches, and, and I got to talk to her one day, and she said, Brother, she said, alcohol is the worst, thing, the worst drug in America. And I told her, I said, explain that to me. Well, Tammy, she had beat meth. She got off of meth. She was on meth, got off of it. But Tammy, she was, a, at one time in her life, she was a social worker. She worked a job as a nurse at a hospital. Had a normal life, socially drinking. Well, what happened was Tammy lost a child at a young age. When she lost that child, she turned into lost. She ended up losing everything that she had. She ended up living on the streets for 13 to 14 years. About a year ago, she was beaten to death. Her case was murdered in her home. But Tammy, she told me, she said, Alcohol is the worst drug because she said, of course, we're going to legalize marijuana in your life out of your game, but she said that if you was uh, addicted to meth, you're addicted to heroin, cocaine, whatever it is, she said, all you got to do is stay away from it. She said, but there's nowhere you can go to get away from alcohol. It's in every store. It's in every restaurant. Everywhere you go. 
Jesus said she couldn't get away from him. But today we're facing that demon, and let me tell you, that's how it works. It starts with one drink. Next thing you know, you got to have another. you got to have another. Right? you got to have something stronger until you end up losing your home, losing your family, losing your job. And you end up at rock bottom. But then I got to thinking, not only do we face that demon of alcohol, but the demon of drugs. Drugs is running rapid throughout America. We have people in there all the time that's on drugs. Uh, I don't know if I told y'all about the Batman or not. I don't know if I told I tell them out there or not. We was in there. I'll never forget. About two or three weeks ago, we have we hire these guys, some of the homeless guys. We give them a little bit of money. We give them like fifteen dollars to mow and weed in. Guy come in there the other day. And What is it? He said, don't you see that monster up there? He said, you don't see that monster up there in the corner? And I said, I don't see nothing. There was a plastic bag hanging up there. He said, that's a monster. Don't you see his eyes? He's, he's after me. He's chasing me. And then all of a sudden, he said, that's all right. Come on back. Let me show you how to get that stuff. I'm going to tell you, he was on some good stuff. But we was down there the next week. Had another guy mowing for me. I don't know what this guy mowed for. But this guy got the hollering and screaming. He said, come here. I said, what? He said, get out here. He said, don't you hear that? I said, what? He said, they're raping that woman. I said, what woman? I hear them. Don't you hear them? He said, you got to hear them. Don't you hear them? And then he turned around. He started arguing with somebody that wasn't there. And he said, come on. I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to go kill him. So we walked off the property, turned to the left there. And at first I thought, well, this ain't too bad. When we turned the corner and he pulled a big old rod and stuck that thong down his britches and said he's going to kill somebody, then I backed up a little bit. We had to get him calmed down, but I'm going to tell you, these drugs are ruining America. These drugs. And you know, our governor down there in Virginia, now he did it. But what can I say? I'm a you, you say, what do you mean? We got a governor that thinks it's all right. To have a baby full of her. Take that baby, put it over here in the hospital while you carry on the conversation and decide what to take home and murder it. I mean, a man like that ain't got no sense. Right. But starting July 1st, we're going to legalize marijuana. And I know y'all already got it up here. You say, well, ain't nothing else wrong with a little bit of marijuana. Let me tell you something. We work with homeless people all over the United States of America, and we run into drug addicts every day. We do an addiction program. I've talked to hundreds of people, maybe more than that, maybe thousands of people. I've sat down, had conversations about their drug addiction. And there's only been one person I ever spoke to who told me that they started with a drug other than marijuana. All the rest of them, every one of them, started with marijuana. They get marijuana, then they want meth, then they want cocaine, and they want something strong. It's destroying our country. We need to get rid of these demons. And then I got to thinking, not only do we have the demons of drugs and the demons of alcohol, but then I got to thinking about that demon of sexual desire. That sexual desire in our nation. And you're saying, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, over in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 23, or verse 24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And then verse 26 says, For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. You know, I got to thinking about the day we're living in a day to where our sexual desires has destroyed our nation. We're living in a day it's just wicked. It's, it's nasty. You say, what are you talking about? Men with men, women with women. You know, back in 1986, 
and before, you know what that was considered? Mental illness. Mental illness. You know what it still is? It's mental illness. They hammer it in their head today that it's acceptable. It's okay. It's not. Let me tell you, it's a sin. Straight out of hell. That's what it is today. But not only that today, we preach a lot on homosexuality. And don't get it wrong. We need to take a stand on it. You know, down in Virginia, I don't know how it is up here. If you go to school in Virginia, if you're a boy, it don't matter if you're in kindergarten or 12th grade. If you're a boy, you You can go right in there in the girls' bathroom. If you're a girl and you feel like you want to be a boy today, that's the way it is, like I said. Virginia's crazy. Well, they're liberal. That's the way it is. That's coming all over America. It's coming here. You say, I don't believe we'll see it in Maine. If you think you'd see gay marriage and all these things take place in the country, it's going to be everywhere. It's coming. But we're living in the days where it's became acceptable. You know, not only do I think about the homosexuality, but today, what about shacking up? A lot of people in our churches today, they they get mad when you preach, or they disagree with homosexuality. But it's all right, shack up, leave it alone. It costs too much money to get married. We don't want to get married. That'll cost us a little extra money. Let me tell you right now. Sex is for one man, one woman, and that's one man, one woman that's married according to God. Fornication is wrong. Adultery is wrong. And we've got people in our churches today that are out here practicing fornication, out practicing adultery. We've got people in our churches today that's leaving God's house on Sunday, and they're going there, and they're picking up that old telephone. Let me tell you, everything's right there at your fingers now. Picking that up, looking at that old porn, and Commit adultery in our heart, it's just as bad. It's the same thing. We need to get rid of those demons of sexual desires. If you're going around hiding out and doing these things, let me tell you, you need to be happy. The husband and wife of God take Nobody else. Nobody else. We're living in that day. And if we went on our Romans 1, it talks about it goes on and talks about haters of God. It talks about being proud. That's where that demonic possession, those, these demons that we let creep in, that's where it gets us to. You ever heard about an atheist? Let me tell you. Every man knows that there's a God. You know what that is? That's a hater of God. This homosexual crowd. A lot of you know what they are? They're haters of God. They're coming after God's man. They're coming after God's house. If you disagree with them, they're, they're wanting to put you in jail. That's where we're headed. Haters of God, and then it talks about how they'll be proud. When I was a boy in high school, I went to Patrick Henry High School. And I guess we was probably a bunch of rednecks. But I'm going to tell you, if a boy came to school and said he was gay, he didn't make it home. He wouldn't have made it out of there. But now, they have their little parades. They got their little rainbow flag. They're so proud of their sin. I see it all the time. People say, well, they'll, they'll run that rainbow flag next to my side. I'm going to tell you something. I realize we've been backsliding and backsliding all my life. But if you're saved, you're going to be ashamed of sin. We're living in a day. They're proud of sin. They're proud to say, look, this is my significant other that they're sacked up with and glorified. We need to call sin what it is. We've accepted too much sin. It's destroying our nation. These demons have creeped into our church. You know, I was hearing a preacher preach the other day. And I don't know. But uh, they said he studied this. He told me this pastor. He said 2020 was the first year in history that the divorce rate was higher in the church than it was outside the church for the first time in history. And we wonder what's wrong with our nation. But then I got to thinking, we got the demon of alcohol, demon of drugs, demon of sexual desire. But then here's another one that a lot of people probably won't like. But I got to thinking about 
Who are you hanging out with? Who are your friends? You're saying, what are you talking about? Well, the Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. It says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, for such one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God, judge it. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So the word of God is telling us here, that drunkard, that idolater, that one out there, that ungodly person, we're to put them away. We're not to go, you say, what do you mean? Say, Jesus went to everybody. Now don't get me wrong. I'm praying we can get homeless people in here. Some of them are going to be drug addicts. Some of them are going to be alcoholics. And let me tell you, they're going to bring them to God's house, preach the word of God to them, bring them to be saved, and pray they'll straighten up and come out of no wicked lifestyle. But let me tell you this. I wouldn't bring them to my home and sit down with them and party with them. A lot of people today, they say, well, preacher, I'm saved. I'm born again. But they're going back to that same old crowd that had them that was out there that was drinking. That same old crowd that they were committing all these ungodly things with. Today we need to separate ourselves. I didn't have that problem. I got born again. I went to my friends. I told them about Jesus. They didn't want nothing to do with me. They didn't want nothing to do with me. But today we're trying to straddle the fence. We're going to God's house. And we're, and we're saying we're saved. But yet we're trying to be popular in the world. Let me tell you. A child of the king's not going to be popular out in the world. The world's not going to like it. If you know Jesus Christ, your Lord, Savior, you know especially a lot of kids. I know a lot of teenagers, a lot of youth. They go to school, they go to places they want to be popular. Let me tell you, if you take a stand on Jesus, you're not going to be popular. You don't have to do it. You're not going to be popular on your job. There's going to be people there that don't like you. You say, why is that? It's not you, it's that they don't like Christ. That's the thing. They don't like Christ. But we're living in a day, like I say, where these demons have just become part of our acceptable life. But these demons today, they're sending. First of all, there's a lot of people today that they're sending to hell. There's a lot of people today that will never accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because that old alcohol, that drug, that sexual desire has got such a grip on them that when they hear the word of God, they'll sit right there and they'll reject it. They'll reject the word of God because the devil says that's going to be born. You know, I remember that. It's a time in my life. The old devil said you can't get saved because that's going to be absolutely boring to be saved. It's going to be miserable. you got to quit this. you got to quit that. you got to give this up. Well, let me tell you, any excuse the devil gives you not to get saved, he's a liar. Because I'm going to tell you, I got saved and I ain't never missed nothing. Let me tell you, it only gets better. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's no drug out there in the world as good as being high on Christ. There's nothing out there that good. But a lot of people today, that that it's got such a grip on them that they won't move, they won't get saved. And then we got a lot of people today Maybe they're saved. But they're letting these material things of the world destroy their lives. They're getting out of God's will. They started that one little drink. Next thing you know, they had another one. Got social drinking. Start missing church. Can't figure out why things are going wrong in their life. Can't figure out why they're having trouble. Because they're getting out of God's will. Let me tell you, the further and further you get from God, the more miserable you're going to be. The more miserable you're going to be when you let these things work. They start accepting sin. I'll never forget, I worked at the job course. And then we had this, I called it brainwashing. We worked for the Department of Labor. They come in and showed us all these videos. Homosexuality. Oh, how it's accepted. And I'll never forget, they was up there teaching us that junk. And I hadn't surrendered to preach long. But they say, well, you're born that way. It's, and they want us to answer the questions the way they want. 
And they went around the room, and I worked with a lot of Baptists up there. And they say, well, this is the way you're born, right? Or this is natural, right? I said, yeah, yeah. They looked over at me, and I said, no. I said, it's a sin straight out of hell. And I said, it ain't nothing but sin. I said, I ain't answering your questions that way. I said, it's wrong. And uh, I got up and left. They said, we're going to fire you. And I said, sure, I'm not here going back to Lincoln. Thank the Lord I didn't get fired, but, you know, I, I finally went to Mission Field and left. But I'm going to tell you today, we need to take a stand. But we've let this sin creep into our lives so much and accepted so much garbage in America that it's weakening our relationship with Christ. It's weakening us. We need to get we need some people today in America a backbone. We need some people that will stand up. You know, the guy down at the park here, they wouldn't talk to him. And all he did was complain about what's going on in America, how they're taking our rights, how they're taking our freedom. And I agree with him, but I'm going to tell you, we need some Christians today that's got a backbone and the Word of God that won't bow down to them and will take the Word of God and preach to them. I mean, I I used to preach in the jail all the time when COVID hit. It's a great place to preach. That's a great place. We're not too far from pastors being in there, preachers being in there. But I'm going to tell you, it's a good place to preach. But then, not only are these demons going to keep some from getting saved, they're dragging others down. But then here's what I got to thinking about in these verses. In verse 15 of uh, Mark chapter 5, it said, And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed of the devil and had legions set in clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The thing is, here was this man that was possessed. He was so wicked. He was so evil. We're living in a day, I think I might have said something about it the other night, but we're living in a day where we've got a bunch of babies out there pacifying. Right. Got a bunch of babies that pacify us. Oh, preacher, I'm saved, but I'm still this. I'm saved, but I'm still that. This man got saved. He was in his right mind. He was in his right mind. I've never seen Jesus Christ save anybody that he didn't take care of their problem. Oh. Now, I realize we can backslide. But I'm going to tell you, I've seen alcoholics for 30 years. Jesus Christ saved their soul. Guess what? They're no longer an alcoholic. They're born again. It's gone. I've seen people on that. Jesus saved their soul. It's gone. And we're living in a day that we've got to pamper them. Oh, they got saved, but they're still an alcoholic. I'm going to tell you, you might ought to go back. You might ought to try again. Because I'm going to tell you today, when I got born again, I became a new creature. And I'm going to tell you, if we don't become a new creature, it's something wrong. Something's wrong today. If we go back and live the same lifestyle that we used to live, like the man downstairs today, he asked me, he said, what do you think about eternal security? And I said, let me tell you, I got something you can't lose. I told him, I said, once we're born again, it's always there. And I said, if you're going to a church tonight and you believe that you're saved today and you're lost tomorrow because you've done something wrong, if your faith ain't in Jesus Christ, your faith is in your good works and you being good enough to get to heaven, I'm going to tell you, we can't work your way. Can't get there that way. But this man, he was a new creature. Not only was he a new creature, but in verse 16 said, And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. So not only was he changed to born again, the other people. The other people could see the change that took place in this man. So not only when I got saved was I born again and changed, my family could see a change. Our friends ought to be able to see a change. If you're sitting here today and you say, well, preacher, I'm born again. Has there been a change you can see? Amen. Has there been a change people around you can see? I worry about this new modern age religion. Everybody comes up and makes a profession of faith and they walk out. And you never see a change in them. You never see anything different in them. But they're saved. Has there been a true change that took place? Amen. This man, he had that change. Not only did he see it, the, the other people saw it. But then here's the part I like. In verse 19. And I'll start with Jesus speaking. It said, go home 
to thy friends and tell them how great the things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. You know, today that's something else I just don't understand. If you're saved today, and I think I might have mentioned this the other night, over 1,500 times in the Bible is the word go. Jesus told many people when they were saved, go, go, go tell us. When was the last time, if you're born again, when was the last time you told somebody else? Word of God says we won't be ashamed of it. I don't understand today if you never open your mouth and tell somebody about Jesus, are you ashamed of it? They say, well, it ain't my job, I ain't the preacher. Let me tell you today, if you're born again, know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You ought to be able to take the Word of God and you ought to be able to show somebody how to ask Jesus Christ into their heart. You ought to be able to tell somebody how to be saved. That's my desire tonight. I want to see more souls here. I want to see more. I want to see more for His glory. Not for my glory, but for His glory. But today, have they demons today crept in, took that desire away from you? You know what I'm talking about, demons? I'm talking about these spirit things that we know if you're saved. We know that uh, Satan can't live. And uh, well, he, he can only live in an unclean temple. But I'm going to tell you, he knows our every weakness. He knows every weakness. If it's pornography, if it's alcohol, drugs, he knows. But let me tell you, he can't take your salvation. But I will tell you this, he can take your testimony. He can get you to the point where you're miserable. So these little things in our life, we need to let them go. These skeletons we got in the closet that nobody knows about. We think it's all right because the preacher don't know. Maybe your husband don't know. Maybe your wife don't know. God knows. God knows and we'll never have the relationship we need to have with him until we get the sin out of our camp. We need to get that sin out of our camp. But first of all, before you can do that, you got to know, first of all, that you've had a change. you got to know that you know that you know. Not hope so, think so, but know so. And I'm going to tell you, whatever excuse the devil gives you not to get saved, he's a liar. He's absolutely lying to you. And uh, so I challenge you today, if you don't know 100% you're saved, don't leave this place in that condition. You say, how serious is it? I just want to share a couple of stories with you, and then we're going to dismiss. But I'm going to tell you how serious it is. Y'all may, may, y'all may already heard this story. I don't know. This story they tell a lot down south. And supposedly it's supposed to be a true story. But there was a church that's having a revival. The preacher came in, preached his heart out all week long, preached on hell. Preached on hell hot. Well, in the back of the church, there was these three teenagers. They sit back there and laughed at him. Preached on hell, kept preaching. Every night they'd come in, sit back there and giggle and laugh. Last night of revival, one of those teenagers walked up to the preacher and he said, Preacher, he said, how far is hell? Well, the preacher didn't know what to say. He didn't know how to answer the question, didn't know what to say. But the preacher left the church that night. He went up the road. He was getting him something to eat. He was, he was evangelist, visiting, visiting evangelist, missionary. But he was up there eating. He heard all these sirens. Pastor of the church come flying in there and said, come look. So what's wrong? There's been an accident. So the preacher got in the car, rode down there with the pastor. Those three teenagers that sit back there on the back row and laughed and asked him that question. They tried to beat a train. Across the train tracks. They were all three dead. He said to the preacher, he said, he said to the pastor of the church, he said, will you drop me up? right here. So they drove to the church. I think he said it was six miles. He looked at the pastor of the church and said six miles. He said, what are you talking about? He said, hell was six miles from the church. He said, that's the answer to their question. Six miles. Then 
another one I'd like to share with you. That this happened in our area. My pastor, Dwayne Dillard, his father-in-law is also a pastor, Les Ketcher. Well, Les Ketcher, it's been about three years ago, they were having a church service. It was time to dismiss. He was given the offer, or he was given the invitation. And he just felt like somebody there needed to do some business. So he extended the invitation. He said he don't usually do that, but he just felt like that time, he said, I'm going to play another song. He said, I feel like there's somebody who needs to move. So they played one more song. There was a lady there that morning. She was a lot like I was. She was made a profession of faith as a child, but she's lost. She was out in the world. She'd come back to church. I think she was like in her 40s. She'd come back to church. They gave the invitation. She came up. She asked Jesus to save her. She accepted Christ. When she got up off that altar, she was shouting, they said. She was shouting. She said, everything's all right. She said, I'm going to heaven. I got things fixed up. She went out and got in her car. She said, I'll see y'all tonight. She got about a mile and a half from the church. Was hit head on and killed. And you say, well, what are you doing? I'm not trying to scare you tonight. But what I'm telling you tonight is how serious it is. If, she, if, he wouldn't have, if the invitation wouldn't have been extended, if she wouldn't have came up, then it would have been too late. It might have been too late. She would have been spending eternity in a place called hell. You say, why are you telling us this, preacher? Because I'm telling you what the devil tells you. You know what the devil says to you? If you're sitting here tonight and you're lost, the devil don't tell you not to get saved. What the devil says, put it off one more service. Right. Put it off one more time. Put it off till the pastor's preaching. Put it off till you get this service or that service. You say, hey, you know that because I sat right there in the church for you knowing I was lost, knowing I was headed to hell, but rejecting Jesus Christ. So tonight I'm going to tell you, the choice is yours. The Lord is a gentle. He'll knock at your heart's door. But I'm going to tell you, it's up to you to receive the gift. You sitting here tonight and you say, well, preacher, I'm just not ready. Well, you know what that means? If you've heard the Word of God preached and you understand the Word of God, and you walk out that door knowing you're lost, then you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, no, I'm not rejected. You have a decision. It's either accept or reject. There is no in between. So what will you do tonight? Will you accept? Will you reject? You know, tonight, I'd just like to ask you, I didn't ask the preacher, I hope it's all right, I'd just like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'd like to ask uh, Marion if she'd come play something. If she comes up, I'd just like to ask you tonight, if you're sitting here, First of all, you say, Preacher, I've got some things in my life I need to get straightened out. I hear everywhere I go, they say, I'm not as close to God as I once was. You know why that is? Most of the time we've allowed some of these things of the world to creep into our life to get between us and God. We've allowed some of these things to interfere with our life. If you're sitting here and you say, Preacher, I'm just not as close to God as I ought to be. Nobody's looking around. I'm not going to come to you and mercy and call you out. But is there anybody that would be honest and just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me? I see that hand, see those hands. Hands up all over the place. Well, you know tonight, you're the only one that can do anything about that. Whatever's between you and God, you need to get rid of. It. You say, what do I do? I challenge you to come around this altar and lay it down at his feet. Don't carry it out of here. Lay it down. Lay that burden down. But then if you sit here tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm sitting here tonight, but you know those demons of the world still got a grip on me. And the devil's told me not to get saved. And if I was to die right now, I'm not ready to go to heaven. I don't know 100% that I'm saved. I'm not going to come to you, embarrass you, call you out or none of that. But I'm going to pray for you. Is there anybody that would just be honest and slip your hand up? Anybody be honest with me? 
I'm not going to tell on you, but I, I love you tonight. I want to pray for you. Anybody at all? Let me just lift that hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. All right, well, she plays tonight. I'm going to get down here myself. We can all get rid of some things in our life. It's easy to let your guard down or get complacent. Things start to creep in between you and the Lord. All of a sudden, church stops to become as important as it ought to be, and you start to lose your joy of your salvation. But thank God that we can ask Him to restore that joy, creating us a clean heart. You don't have to be miserable if you're saved. You can get right. And if you're not saved... Don't leave this building tonight without making it right. By faith, call out on Jesus Christ. Humble yourself. Ask Him to save you. Father, I thank You for that message. And Lord, it was preached with such conviction coming from a preacher who spends a lot of time with people who are messed up in those sins messed up with those demons of alcohol and drugs and, and sexual desires and pornography and all those things, Lord, that entangle us and entrap us. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be vigilant, to be sober, because uh, we have an adversary, the devil, seeking whom he may devour. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here not saved, the Holy Spirit of God would not stop knocking on their heart's door until they get saved. And we thank you for the message that we heard. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Brother Zach will come. He'll close us in a song.